and welcome to today's show, everyone. Um, I'm here with John Fabeke. Um, just prior to going live, I was asking John if he had any questions for me, and he said maybe it might be better if I sort of introduced myself a little bit to, to him before starting this conversation on the stream, so as it's kind of there in the video, and then um, I'll sort of invite him to do the same thing for himself. So um, I guess a bit about me would be, I mean, in terms of the spaces that I'm in, I have been in a space sort of adjacent to you, John. So I, I was actually a kind of a Jordan Peterson fan when I was about 18, 19 um, was when I first came across Jordan Peterson. Um, and then I subsequently converted to Christianity actually after um, watching his biblical series. And then I became a Calvinist. Um, I was a Christian for about, for, for I mean, it took me about a year to kind of get over the line to converting. And then I'd say I was a Christian for about a year and then deconverted. Um, and that was a long kind of traumatic process for me, actually, because of the number of beliefs that I'd adopted um, the kind of hope, meaning and purpose that Christianity had provided me. Right. And right. Um, I was also being kind of pressured into getting married at a really young age by the community I was in. And so I'd um, bought, a, you know, my first house at uh, 21 and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So I um, so, so I, I deconverted um, and a lot of my YouTube followers have kind of um, come across me through um, my documenting of my deconversion process. I was left with philosophical questions kind of in the wake of that um, process. Um, and so I, th over the past year, I did a full-time uh, master's in philosophy. So I left my job and went um, off to do that. And I've just finished. I'm a little bit disillusioned with philosophy now and going back to the world of work, but that's kind of a little bit about me, I suppose. And then I don't know if you want to just introduce yourself and my audience who might not be familiar with you and, and anyone else. Sure. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Um, so my name is John Ravakey. I'm uh, an associate professor at the University of Toronto in cognitive psychology and cognitive science. Um, like you, I've studied philosophy academically. I have a PhD in philosophy. Um, and like you, I, uh, I was brought up well, more than in some ways, more than you, uh, you were only in it for a year. I was a kid, right. <laughs> fundamentalist Christianity, and uh, yeah. and uh, I came out of it, and uh, and uh, and retrospectively, you know, with therapeutic work and intervention, realized how much it had traumatized me. Um, I went into uh, academic philosophy, um, hoping to get answers like you. Um, um, I encountered two streams of philosophy, ancient philosophy, figure of Socrates has had a profound influence on me, and then what you might call modern or current academic, analytic, and continental philosophy. I continued on in that um, uh, because I enjoyed the skills, um, the meta science, the meta culture, the meta ethics skills, but um, the, 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 the satisfying of the sort of spiritual taste that Christianity had left in my mouth that I found in the Socratic and Platonic tradition wasn't being addressed uh, in academic philosophies. I continued on, like I said, because I found it intrinsically valuable, but I took up Tai Chi Chuan and Buddhist meditation, contemplation, and these transformative practices for the cultivation of wisdom. And then I got involved, I got a, a specialist, a BSc in cognitive science, got involved in cognitive science and the two streams started to come together. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of work uh, around this, um, both, um, you know, the, the work I publish, the, what I teach at the university, and then I've done some YouTube series. Uh, one is Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, um, and then there's an ongoing discussion series, uh, Voices with Raveki, where I talk to people, much like we're doing now. And then I have some series on what I call the, uh, my, um, the playlist, the Cognitive Science Show, where me and a, another person, a couple other people, we try and enter into a collaborative process of trying to uh, understand some phenomena from uh, a cognitive scientific point of view, consciousness, the nature of the self, the nature of transformation. So I, I think that's most of me <laughs> in, in some ways. So there's sort of a, a unique um, set of spaces that kind of intersect, I suppose, around you. Um, and mm -hmm. some of the people, most of my audience will be familiar with people like um, Paul Van der I've had a number of conversations with him. Yeah. Um, and Jordan Peterson, I do, obviously because he's fairly famous now and I do, I do quite a lot of videos about him, so my audience all. Um, and you're sort of in, in those spaces and Jonathan uh, Peugeot as well. But I suppose you're, 
even though you're kind of broadly, I don't know if you would self-identify as being kind of like an intellectual dark web type thinker or something like that. Um, you can tell me if you if you self-identify that way. I don't know. No, but you're, I, I don't. Yeah. So yeah, so, yeah I, I won't put that label on you then. But I'd say so, some of your ideas are sort of um, appealing to people who are in those communities. Maybe you'd accept, uh, accept that much. And I suppose from my point of view, I'm kind of the the caricature boogeyman of that is because I'm like a reductive naturalist and uh you know a yeah. postmodernist and all these uh horrible things that um sure. mean that my life is meaningless and that I <laughs> kill babies and eat them and stuff like that so I thought this conversation could be interesting because just fr from the point of view of um you know I'm someone who kind of adopts I, I suppose very different positions to yourself but I also sort of think um, that I do understand um, a lot of your ideas. And I guess I've not seen a lot of conversations with people who like, you know, really like take the opposite position to yourself. I've seen sure. lots of conversations sure. with people who sort of are broadly accepting of lots of these ideas, but maybe, I, I, I don't know if you wanted to just comment on my initial thoughts there, maybe. Um, I know it's not, it's not much of a question, but just to give you some space. No, no, to... I, I mean, I, I think it's fair. I, I mean, um... In some ways, I think you're right, uh, but in other ways, I find that I'm often talking across significant divides. I'm talking to people who are committed Christians, and I'm not, or I'm talking to people who are Jews or Muslims, or, or, and I'm not. Um, even talking to Buddhists, and I don't identify that way. Um, so I often I am getting pushback from people having sort of established worldviews uh, that I want to challenge. Um, do I get a, a, about uh, I get a broadly uh, challenges around some of I guess the cognitive scientific things I'm saying? Not so much on the YouTube, but of course I get it in my in my professional work. I get it. I mean, I have to go through the peer review process. I have to prevent it, present at conferences. I just came back from one and take the difficult questions. Um, so that's a bit of a disjunct for me. There's a bit of a difference between the interactions I have in what you might call my professional world. And the interactions I have on YouTube, um, but part of that is also I'm trying, um, I'm trying to do a lot of experimentation with this medium, and I'm trying to get out. I'm not, I'm not precluding anything we want to engage into here, but I'm trying to get out of the sort of people yelling at each other and endless yeah. debate that is uh, is chewing up YouTube, and, and as far as I can see, to no good purpose. Um, so entertaining, <laughs> I think. Yes, that's it's entertaining a... <laughs> and it helps sell products and it helps keep corporate capitalism going and all those wonderful things. But um, I'm also I'm I'm also interested in uh, can this medium serve to give people the kinds of connections that they're hungry for and seeking for. And um, right. so that's a bit of a difference. But I'm you know I'm happy also to have a good faith uh, discussion with somebody who disagrees. Uh, with me significantly like i say that's a that's a that's a mainstay for me within my academic world yeah i, th I think we sort of agree in um goals there because i mean i i certainly find myself with a lot of people who have um deconverted sort of congregating around my channel you know and there's a bit of a community of people who regularly come back and maybe i, I mean maybe there's even a sense of people sort of processing um a kind of trauma like how did i give so many years of my life to this thing or you know how do i pro how you know, just unable to kind of leave this thing behind in the past. And so that, you know, like the, if being able to have a community where you like can joke about it or look at the apologetics and stuff and go, uh, you, you know, it, it gives you that a, a bit of that meaning and community maybe that um, yeah that religion used to used to provide. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, I, I, I'm speaking from my own experience coming out of that, uh, the deconversion process. And, you know, it's probably also a factor that I was taught for a long time as a kid. But it, take, it took me a long time, and I see it taking a lot of people a long time. They go through sort of different stages. Um, and so I have a lot of sympathy with people that are coming out of a religious framework and, and struggling to find a reorientation in the world uh, that makes sense for them and makes sense with others for them. So I'm hoping that my interview isn't going to come across as sort of too negative, but I do have like a number of criticisms of, th of things that you said from my point of view. Sure. And I, sure. I, you know, I, I hope you can see that I'm asking these things because, um, you know, I, I genuinely disagree and I'm not just trying to make you like, um, I, I'm not trying to like do a gotcha thing or like be comfortable no, no. or anything like no, that. That's fine. As long as you're uh, like, uh, as long as it's coming in good faith, I'll, I'm happy to talk. Cool. Um, so, so I think my, the first question that I have is, um, sort of from 
your work and um, sort of circles around you, people like Paul van der Kley, a lot of people seem to adopt kind of idiosyncratic uses of language, right? So um, terms like dialogos or relevance realization, things like that. And mm -hmm. I, I personally have struggled with people using these terms because I guess I don't see them doing that much more than the sort of English cognate that we already have, like dialogue or with maybe with relevance realization, it's like um, maybe like just f focus or paying attention to something like that, right? Mm. To something, I, I mean, maybe maybe you would dispute that um, if you're using it in, in like a more technical sense, but those are the ways I broadly see these terms being used. And then I, may, I see them because it sounds like you're kind of speaking in a classical language or something that a lot of people in these communities from my point of view then, sort of think that they're saying something quite profound because they're using like a technical sounding term, mm -hmm. but they're actually just saying like an ordinary English sentence, like I wanna have, when they're like, oh yeah, cause we wanna have dialogos. From my point of view, they're saying like, well, we just wanna have conversations, but it, it's like, but but from their point of view, they think they've sort of like said something more. And I, I, and, um, I think that this almost functions like a, um, you know, like an in-group, out-group marker. If you if you've adopted the language versus if you haven't, and sure. um, but it, but it, I don't know that it's actually like um, doing any work in terms of helping people figure something out who are then in the in-group, uh, rather rather than just providing like a social function of delineating who's on the in-group and who's in the out-group. And I wondered what your response to that would be, um, sure. just because obviously I think you've coined some of these words, and th so you perhaps think there's something more going on. Yeah. Well, let's do the. The, the easier of the two. I mean, relevance realization is an actual published theory about trying to solve a particular problem uh, in the explanation of intelligence, which is um, how, and it, it's not captured by a word like focus or attention uh, because it deals with the very specific problem of how do you get a system to zero in on the relevant information, ignore the irrelevant information without checking all that information and determining that it's irrelevant. Um, and that and so I think that the reason why people might be seeming to use it the way you're, you're, you're saying, the relevance realization, is, you know, I can't control the degree to which uh, people have paid attention to uh, the, ex you know, the extensive explanation of relevance realization. And, you know, and I keep publishing on it. I published in the Journal of Phenomenology and Cognitive Science two, two articles this year on relevance realization theory, integrating it with predictive processing, for example. So I think it's a bona fide theory, it, and um, and therefore um, using it is 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 meant to be an explanatory uh, use. It's trying to explain a central function of cognition and link that functionality to particular phenomenology, uh, like the notion of the way salience is playing out, the connections between attention and salience that are not intuitively obvious when you use words like focus. Even the notion of focus is, you know, using a spotlight model of attention, focusing a beam of light that is, you know, actually misleading in powerful ways. And I go into that in the series. And so I'm trying to get people to understand attention, understand salience and understand intelligence uh, with this notion. So I think that is how I respond to the relevance realization. The dialogos is I'm trying to put my finger on these, these practices that I've engaged in, uh, like circling, like empathy circling, like Buddhist dialogue, in which people are creating a different set of guideposts and normative structures for how the conversation will uh, un uh, unfold, because what they're trying to do is not just converse, not just share information, but they're trying to engage in generating something like a mutual flow state that often puts them into an ability to understand themselves and other people in a more profound way, just like the flow state within, you know, playing a game of hockey will put you into optimal performance or getting into the flow state while you're in uh, martial arts it is uh, conducive to optimal performance. And I'm trying to understand <clears throat> what are the conditions and the constraints both within and without that bring that about and why people are like, as far as I can tell, independently, all around the world, creating these communities, why are they so central? What are they doing in them that seems to matter? And what seems to matter is this uh, ability to, within that sh shared flow state, to get ways of having insight about themselves, 
their social and emotional relationships to other people, and even their relationship to the world at large. And so I do not think that is conveyed by the word uh, dialogue. Um, and that is what I'm trying to um, convey with the notion of dialogos. Um, and I'm, I'm generating a whole new series around it called After Socrates to try and articulate um, what exactly that process looks like. Yeah, I, so maybe just on the first point, because I don't, I don't want to talk about too much all at once, I suppose, would be, um, so recently, I don't know how recently it was recorded, but um, recently released was your interview with Lex Friedman, right? And um, yeah. when you introduced relevance realization with him and in many other places and, and people uh, who kind of follow your work, like Paul Vanderclay, repeat this as well. Um, so people will mention like co there's a problem of combinatorial explosion, for example, sure. right? Yes, yeah. And I guess I, I kind of take issue with this when, so I understand if someone talks about combinatorial explosion in terms of um, analyzing algorithmic asymptotic complexity or something, right? Like, it, um, but, but I've not actually seen a particular um, algorithm or problem being introduced that is um, n factorial, um, big O n factorial, right? Um, and I don't even know what n is here in this case. So, so the idea of there being something that is um, combinatorially explosive is that you've got this exp uh, th this function that's growing, you know, is at, at, at n factorial rate. And and I don't even know what n is in that case. And I think that there's almost like a, a metaphor being made to something using language that sounds sort of mathematical and computational. And maybe maybe I'm wrong, and this is just because I've not engaged with the academic literature on the subject and just engaged with like the popular stuff. But it, it seems like a lot of people are using this word to make it sound like they're saying something scientific, but actually all they're saying is like, um, there's a lot of ways of looking at something, but the the actual use of combinatorial explosion there is is like mathematically incorrect because there isn't something that's, you know, they might mean maybe there's like, an, a, a very large number or an infinite number of different ways you could look at something, but there isn't actually something that grows um, n factorial, right? And, and, and I, I guess I just take, I, I have have a problem with that because I'm like, why why is that very precise, specific piece of mathematical terminology being used, you know, if it, if it isn't doing that? So maybe, maybe it is in the technical literature and you can uh, address that concern. Yeah, so the term was imported into psychology uh, by uh, Holyoke uh, when he was uh, explaining uh, the work that was taken up by Simon, Newell and Simon, uh, when he was doing a, a problem solving and he was giving uh, a standard example, which you may have seen me do, about, you know, um, the, a search space. And this is how Newell and Simon analyzed uh, problem solving and which you have your initial state, your goal state, and then you have all the various options opening up. And you know, he gave the example of a chess game and where you can calculate the number of alternative pathways you have to seek as, you know, F to the D, where F is the number of average moves on any turn and D is the number of turns and it's 30 to the power of 60, which is larger than the number of atomic particles in the universe. And that's when he, he, he used the term combinatorially explosive for that. And that's how it was used within the problem solving literature because the idea is, <clears throat> any attempt to solve that with finite processing like we have is going to doom you to failure. You can't do any kind of exhaustive search. So the question becomes, how do you select the pathways? Because you don't have a bird's eye view. How do you zero in on them without checking to see if they're um, going to lead to your goal state or not? And so this brought up the whole notion of bounded rationality by people like um, uh, uh, Simon and Newell. And so the notion of the combinatorial explosive first space is exactly that notion. I never ever uh, said it was infinite. When people do that, I try to correct them and say sort of indefinitely large, um, things like that. Um, but that's the problem I'm pointing to. And this is still one of the central problems in AGI. Um, do it, uh, how to avoid, an, you can't do an algorithmic search because uh, most algorithmic searches are going to commit you to a combinatorially explosive search. You're just gonna be searching forever and you can't do an arbitrary search. So the issue is how do you get intelligent behavior that's between the arbitrary and the algorithmic? That's what I'm pointing to with relevance realization. Now, 
I, I'm hoping that that's what people are pointing to when they use the phrase, because if that's what they're pointing to, they're pointing to something real and it's central to uh, the question of the nature of intelligence. I, I guess maybe to make the question more specific, I sort of, I understand how that applies um, in modeling um, an algorithm for playing chess, but sure. I don't understand, I, I don't understand the bridge between the chess case and the case of, of my perception, you know? So what, what the, individual bits are mapping to i mean like what what is the algorithm in the case of um the, the, uh, it, the yeah so what the the idea is anything you're doing this is i guess the main claim you wanted me, me to get to anything you're doing any even perceptual act is an act of problem solving you are trying to you're in some in it like even in an initial state and you're trying to look at an object there's a goal state about trying to look at that object and there's many different alternative pathways you can engage in uh, and, and and you could count the, the number of things you could do in order to move around, reorient your rotation. You could open one eye, close another eye. And so the I, I guess what you're asking is, how do you designate the operators? Well, I mean, th that's sort of a question you do when you're reflecting on any problem formulation. That's part of the problem, right? And, and the, and this is another issue. It's not the same issue as the combinatorial explosion. Many of our problems are ill-defined, and, and we precisely don't know how to uh, de uh, how to individuate or designate or select or activate the right operators. What is the right way to look at this object? I mean, what what does that mean? What are the operations I should bring in? I, I can focus my attention. I can widen it. I can move closer. I can move farther away. And and so again, it. When you try to put that in to a search space, and this is one of the problems, you know, in AI vision and AI categorization, like seeing this as a remote is a terrifically hard problem. It's a very, very hard problem. And we're just now getting some machines that are getting closer to being able to see this as something and see it in the right way to use it in the right way. And they, they're facing this issue that I'm, I'm pointing to. They get into these really huge search spaces, multidimensionality, and how to how degree to which it should be compressed, the degree to which it should be left uncompressed. These are real issues. And so I see them in the vision research. I see them in the categorization research. So I see the problem that that meta problem is essentially the same. I see that it, it also in problems around communication about how the conveyances expand much faster than any of the explicit statements, et cetera, et cetera. Now I go over that, uh, those converging arguments in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And I also was in the paper I published with Tim Lovecraft and Blake Richards in 2012, so. So I guess I'll leave that point just to, because there are more points I want to move on to given sure. the time. Um, I guess an another um, term that's been used and introduced kind of recently um, or egregores, and I don't know, I don't know how the extent to which your kind of like advocacy um, for these things goes. But do you, do you want to say if you do kind of advocate for these things, or if it's just a, an idea? You so that that's problematic for me because first of all, I misunderstood the term that was being used. I misheard it in one conversation, and I, I put that in the, okay. the notes uh, because I do. I published three papers recently with Dan Chiappi uh, talking about um, the NASA scientists moving the rovers around on Mars. And the basic argument there is there's no one person, there's no one thing that's moving the rover. There's a complex dynamical system of people and the equipment that is actually responsible for navigating the rover. And this is very similar to Hutchins' famous book, Cognition in the Wild, where he made the argument that no one person navigates a ship. It's an entire system of people and the equipment that does the navigation. There's a lot more work going on around this notion, you know, Clark and Chalmers and other people, uh, Gallagher, um, and well, like I said, the work that I've published with Dan, arguing that there is a collective intelligence in this kind of distributed cognition. We explicitly argued in the most recent paper we published, um, again, in the journal Phenomenology and Cognitive Science, that we, it's, and other people are arguing for this too, to a, for a notion of we agency, that there's something we can do as a group that is is more than the sum of all of our individual action. And Hole, of course, um, has, pr has produced sort of some recent mathematical proofs that that is in fact the case. So 
I'm committed to the idea that there is collective in intelligence within distributed cognition and that there is a kind of we agency attached to that or that, that's not the right word um, interwoven with that but I have s s consistently resisted attributing subjective consciousness or self-awareness uh, to this we agency I've in fact at times said that it, you know it's in the literature it's called zombie agency uh, for that reason and so to the degree to which we're talking about that I'm I, I'm in agreement with people like Jonathan Pajot and Paul Vanderglee. Now, Paul and I differ because Paul thinks it's still an open question whether or not these, um, I don't want to call them uh, egregores, uh, whether or not these uh, distributed cognitive systems are conscious. Now, I've said, and other people have argued this, uh, you know, famously Chalmers and Clark, that the reason why these collectivities don't have consciousness isn't one in principle because you can't make it one in principle or then you wouldn't be able to explain how neurons could give rise to consciousness it's 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 but it's one of serious practicalities i talk about you know speed complexity density degree of recursion etc that don't exist in these entities these hyper agents that clearly exist in agents that are uncontroversially conscious like you or i or you know elephants and chimps and so I think it is very plausible that we can talk about the intelligent agency of these things, but not attribute to them self-awareness or self-consciousness. Now, when I was talking, just a minute, and I'll let you respond, Nathan. It's a long answer because I'm trying to make a nuanced distinction. When I was talking to Jonathan to this, and I've talked to him recently about it, there was a place in the dialogue where he, he actually was very open to the conclusion that maybe they don't have self-awareness, they don't have a sense of self, and that they are, um, they're not centers of subjectivity in a, any sort of standard notion. And so I thought that's where we had sort of come to. Um, and um, have people in the past perhaps thought of these or related to these uh, collective, this collective intelligence within distributed cognition using, you know, mythological terms like gods and angels? I mean, that's a Durkheimian thesis. That's a sort of a well-established thesis uh, within anthropology, sociology. I, I don't think that's an implausible idea. And insofar as Jonathan is talking that people might relate to these things in this mythological fashion, I also find that a plausible premise. That's where the agreement is. Beyond that, I don't agree. And so that's why I'm hesitant to use a certain term. But to be fair to me, I have said all of this in public in these dialogues. Yes, yeah, so I mean, there's a few avenues that I would like to go down with this. Maybe I can put them on the table and whatever sticks around <laughs> um, sticks around um, for you. So so what one question is just in terms of the theory itself, right? Because I can't I can't necessarily say this for yourself, but certainly in terms of um, Jonathan and Paul, I mean, they talk about these things, th this idea firstly in very unclear terms so they're not they're not being precise according to me um in clarifying what they're actually committing themselves to philosophically so whether they're saying that um that there's a kind of like grounding relation or a relation of fundamentality that kind of you know it where, where there's something that's more fundamental than other things that is you know the the egregore or the co distributed collective entity or whatever because it sounds like they want to sort of get that but then sometimes they sort of retreat from that because they want it because it well to me at least it seems like they're sort of scared of making that claim or something i don't know um and then and then yeah. and then i think if they if they do make that claim then that the, i've never really seen an attempt to actually engage in theory comparison between a theory that like postulates okay because jonathan likes to say bottom up and top it's bottom up and top down right and it's like, okay, well, let's postulate um, fundamental entities at the top and at the bottom and just compare that to like a reductive naturalist theory or something in terms of, uh, you know, can, so can both fit the data? I mean, I think but there, are, there are both, there are types of theories that can both fit the data. Um, what type of entities are being postulated? How many, how many different kinds and things like that? And I think that that's where the actual discussion is to be had in theory choice, right? Is in actually fleshing out those. And I just don't really see that happening. I just see, this a kind of like loose talk right about 
how there are these things, that's a given, and um, therefore anyone who's a materialist is just some dogmatic weirdo who thinks the world's made up of um, billiard balls hitting each other or something. And, and that's that's sort of what I hear and get very triggered by. Um, so oh, yeah, well, feel free to... <laughs> sure, I think that's reasonable too. Um, uh, there have been multiple points where I've pushed back against it. I don't think... I mean, even calling it materialism is kind of a misnomer. I think physicalism is a better term for a lot of important reasons, but, but we can put that aside. I get your point, um, and it was recorded, so it will show up in public, so I'm not, I'm not doing a palming darkness thing. Like At one point, I directly asked both Paul and Jonathan at the conference in Thunder Bay, could these entities exist independently of human beings? Right? Because you yeah. can't have it both ways. Um, I, my answer to that is a very clear no, they can't. And if what you mean by angel, and I said that, and if what you mean by angel or demon is they pre-exist or they can exist independently of human agency, then then I'm not agreeing with that, right? But did you and receive so, a clear answer, right? <laughs> is that <laughs> I did. I think from uh, I think from Jonathan, I got a clear answer. I'm not so sure I got a clear answer from Paul. Um, and I don't I don't want to I don't want to criticize people in absentia because. Uh, sure. I want to also acknowledge, I want to put on the table that Paul and Jonathan are also trying to do other things than theory building in these discussions that are just as valuable to them as the project of theory building. And I do respect that. Um, I'm engaged in community building and other things, and I know what that's like, and that's an important responsibility. Uh, I got a clear answer from Jonathan. Now, I'm, I'm hesitant because my memory like yours is is biased and I'm sure it's engaging in, in reconstruction right now. It's been a couple of weeks and I've been to one conference in between. But what I remember is that he basically said, no, they can't, um, which I thought was a really gutsy answer on his part. Uh, and he was trying to come up with, and he was presenting an argument. He was trying to come up with this idea of something like, not particular human beings, but something like humanity in general. He was invoking the medieval concept uh, from Eastern Orthodoxy, sort of anthropos, right? As somehow the entity that was um, responsible for the creation of these. Um, and so I need to know more about that. And he has promised that he and I will talk more about that. We were supposed to do a conversation about it, but we ended up talking about something else. So what I can say to you is he answered no, he realizes the problem for a sort of standard Christian metaphysics. He's trying to introduce something from the tradition that he thinks can serve as an intermediary or bridging. And so in that sense, I, I see him moving in response to the question. I need more from what he means by this. I've only seen one talk and I have asked him to talk to me about it. Um, and, and so that's as much as I can say. I got I don't know if you'd consider it, Nathan, a clear answer, but I, 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 it was a responsible attempt to become clearer and more definitive, recognize the problem of the commitment to certain claims and trying to respond to them. And I thought that was a good move on his part. Yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think you're sort of um, obviously treating him very, very fairly in, in how you're kind of analyze, uh, analyzing um, his response and stuff. I think this this sort of ties into what another one of my questions with was, was with respect to egregores. So, I mean, I got a clip, but I don't think it's worth playing. Um, I think you'll, you'll trust my word for it, but again, you know, I could, I could be slightly wrong. In the I details. will trust your word for it. I mean, I, <laughs> Where, I, I, I think you're, you're an honest person, Nathan. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting any. Well, I try to be. <laughs> well, as, as do I. Um, so, so please continue. So, so it's just where in a conversation with Jonathan, where he basically says something to the effect of, you know, and it, like, I'm really happy um, with your work, John, because it provides us with um, the scientific language with which to describe these things that the medievals were talking about and so on or something like that. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and then I think from my point of view, there's something sort of troubling and, and worrying about that because I, I, think, I think Jonathan does have a lot of like harmful and false uh, supernatural beliefs where he will attribute um, demon possession to basically people who he disagrees with politically or perhaps like ethically or morally and things like that. Um, and there's a similar, no, this is specifically with respect to egregores and provi providing a scientifically, a scientific sounding vocabulary um, for 
essentially what I think should just be viewed as sort of superstitious um, beliefs that should be rejected um, from my point of view. But it, it would also be maybe that there's a sense of, well, yeah, we're having like a really deep conversation that marries together theology and cognitive science and stuff like that. And it, this is something that happens with Peterson as well. But the problem is, I think, with some of these ideas that were, okay, now, now we've provided some of these people with a scientific vocabulary, but where the rubber hits the road with these ideas, outside of having the interesting conversation at the intersection of subjects, is often like ideas like Christian nationalism, um, you know, like the um, and being anti climate change, people making the decision to like vote for Donald Trump again in the US, maybe, or, um, you know, not to make positive consumer choices that will benefit the planet because Jordan Peterson's angry about climate change and it's a political sure. point. And, th and, yeah. I, yeah. I, and I guess that, so, so the, qu the question to you to finally get around to it, because I realize I'm kind of rambling at that point, is just, is just to say, do, do you worry that sometimes some of the people you're talking to and some of the ideas that you're talking about, maybe you're not being uh, cautious enough about how they're being deployed by other people, um, which obviously it's, it, you can't control what they're gonna do with them, but maybe there's a responsibility there for you to be aware of how they're being used. And then if they're being used in these harmful ways to really provide some pushback, you know, to make sure that doesn't happen. And I, and I think that's a good question and it's a fair question. And I do reflect on it and I do talk to the people that I trust uh, to give me good advice about it. Um, I, I, I tend to treat this on a case by case basis. Um, so for example, Jordan Peterson is a problematic uh, for me. Um, I do not, and I publicly said this many times, and to him, I do not agree with um, a, a, his political positions. And I do not think that people should take whatever impact they have from his insights about myth or mythology to in any way authorize conclusions he's drawing about the pol political situation in Canada. And uh, I, I, I've been clear on this. You shouldn't do that. Uh, I often talk about the two Jordans. And, and to me, it's, it's analogous on the left with Chomsky. Chomsky get, gets a lot of credence for some of his political philosophy from his authority as a linguist. And he himself admits there's no clear connection between those two discourses. Uh, but that, that bleed happens there. So it's not just a, on the right. It also happens on the left. And so uh, I, you know, I'm very careful around that. Paul and, and Jonathan, I take them to be, and I haven't seen some of the things you're alluding to about uh, for jo Jonathan, so I, I, I'll just have to respond from what I've seen and interacted. For them, I feel that, they are, that there is an, an effort, and there's going to be mistakes and there's going to be some sloppiness, but I feel like it's the effort, you know, parallel in the, in the Middle Ages to somebody like Aquinas or Augustine at the end of antiquity, trying to take the philosophical tradition and the religious traditions and marry them together and and that's a that's a weird process it's not it's not straight deduction it's not straight into you know it's not straight induction it, it has some ab abductive elements in it to it but there's also the creation of new terms new concepts um, that's why i often use the term that carrie used for talking about uh, augustine in his book the this latin term inventio that it, it, it it's doing both of these at the same time, and I see, um, and just to be just to be clear, uh, both Jonathan and Paul were talking about this at the Thunder Bay conference that they feel that there's there's something big happening, and they were even proposing the idea that Christianity may be going through a transformation as radical as that of around uh, the time of Augustine or Aquinas. And insofar as I think they are struggling, as am I, as am I to integrate those two worlds together, I'm willing to cut them quite a bit of slack. I mean, because you're going to get a lot of noise when you're trying to do that. Um, I guess, so, you know, sorry to interrupt, but I, I guess that, that kind of is the heart of my question is, you know, why why do you feel that you're so willing to cut them slack, right? Um, because I guess from my point of view, the reason I'm not willing to cut them slack is because I, I mean, that, that's quite strong language. The language that popped into my head is because that project's worthless. <laughs> but like, um, because I, I just, I don't see any use to it personally. I, I mean, so maybe you do see a use to it and, yes. or, or, or there's some other reason and you could express. Okay, so uh, thank you, that's clarifying. And that's exactly what it comes down to. Do I feel that this project is, is helping uh, individuals? Do, and for me, the, the individuals I'm talking about, 
Is it helping people um, respond to the meaning crisis, join real ecologies of practices, engage in transformation, et cetera? And for me, this, the standard is, uh, are they getting you know, good feedback from people other than themselves that they're becoming wiser in, uh, in, and, and more virtuous? And I think by that measure, there is progress being made uh, because of the number of people that I talk to that tell me that these dialogues, as you put it, um, are actually helping uh, to generate ways of thinking and being and often not for people who are entering a religious framework. I talk to lots of people that are deconverting, that are leaving. I've talked to Mormons on more than one occasion who have found my work very helpful for leaving the Mormon church and the, the dialogues because it gives them a, you know, a bridging discourse. And insofar as I think creating that is, and to my mind, important for the culture at large. And I think that the work with Jonathan and with Paul, but also with Sevilla and a whole bunch of other people, Rebel Wisdom, the degree to which that is making real progress, I think it's worth it. I'm not denying the risks that you're pointing to, but we're doing it. We have to do it. I mean, all problem solving involves this. You have to do a cost benefit analysis. You and I probably disagree on this. I think the benefits right now outweigh the costs. Now, I try to ameliorate the cost issue by continuing on, trying to you know, make arguments. Um, I'm doing a whole new series, trying to clarify th th a lot of these terms. Uh, when we're publishing the book, which we are, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, uh, I've added in a 40-page glossary trying to explain all the terms so that they won't be used loosely anymore. So I do want to respond to the costs. Uh, but for me, yes, I judge that um, the benefits are outweighing the costs. And so the conversations are valuable and important. Um, I don't know how else to measure yes. that. Maybe, I mean, something I would be interested in would be to gather like um, survey data from some of these communities where that people are. So I know like you've got your own Discord server or there's like yes. Paul Vanderclay's Discord server. And the pe to see what kind of, selection mechanisms are at play within those communities because you know what kind of people hang around over time because i suspect and you know maybe i shouldn't believe this very strongly without this data that there are a lot of people who have relatively like um the reason that they're not integrating well into society is because they might have like harmful or prejudiced either political views or views towards sexuality and things like that i think that's why i actually was um in some of these communities for a time. And whenever I do go and revisit, um, particularly like um, Bridges of Meaning, there's a lot of people who, you know, are very feel very threatened by um, the idea that for so some people, the best decision might be for them to medically transition to a different gender or something, or they're very caught up in the culture wars discourse. And, the, and there's all this stuff probably going on where the YouTube algorithm, right, is recommending them constantly, like um, all these things. So they've got a kind of, um, availability bias or heuristic thing going on where they think there's this massive problem because they're constantly consuming it. And then that feeds back into, you know, the community and the panic and all that. Um, and, and, and I'm wondering then if what, what these, um, spaces do is they sort of provide <laughs> to use, to use the word a safe space for people to have, um, to have these philosophical conversations and be like, well, we're having the important conversations, right? But what having the important conversations means there is just, it is like doing something pleasurable. But there, I don't know that there's any like, I, I don't know what like actionable progress or, um, sure. or um, you know, pragmatically what these beliefs do other than give people like a kind of special time that where they feel a sense of community and stuff like that. I mean, would you agree that that is the main goal of, of what's going what well, if you wanted to respond to any of the stuff i said about survey data and people's beliefs that's fine as well but uh, do, you, do you think that that's the main goal of these communities is to provide people with like a space to um feel um sort of okay. Let me friendship okay. there's, two, yeah. there's two sort of questions in that question i think there's one about uh um sort of the, the sort of empirical validity and then there's another one about what's the primary motivation um on the first one um 
um, I'm doing I'm, I'm doing a lot of participant observation. Did a pilot study where I go to a particular um, uh, um, uh, community. I did Rafe Kelly's Evolve Move Play, not religiously oriented, although it has um, some some at times scary. Uh, I don't mean like violent, but scary uh, ritualistic aspects to it. That you have to really challenge yourself because uh, you know you're integrating parkour and martial arts and mindfulness and uh, and um, uh, and nature awareness. Um, and as far as I can tell, these people, I mean, and like I said, I did an actual pilot study where hope, and we made an application to, uh, to get a grant, uh, in order to go back and do a more extensive, uh, study. Uh, but I was able to interview, uh, 12 people and use some sort of standard, uh, measures on them, scales on them. And I'm not, I wasn't getting any evidence that they're there because they're sort of, broken or traumatized they were there because they want to find a kind of comprehensive uh, self-transcendence um, that would be the best way to put it that puts them more in connection with themselves other people in the world um, and that means that some of the the conversations we're having um, had two no three but one recently with greg enriquez and rachel hayden and rachel hayden is going through uh, gender transition, and she's been offering and arguing for an aspirational model as a philosophically and psychologically better model of how to understand gender transition than the medical model or the standard romantic model. And she's making a case for it and an argument for it. And then Greg came in and he, he so the three of us were talking, he was bringing in a psychotherapeutic perspective. Now, I think that's, uh, I don't think that's people just comforting each other. I think that's people trying to come up with a new understanding that, and this is what she's arguing, it's helped her do, and she wants to see if it's the case that it helps other people go through, uh, you know, gender transformation. And and so I, I can say I'm doing a lot of participant observation, started, uh, done some pilot studies, hoping to do more uh, extensive study. I, I do not think it's the case that the, the, the people that are involved in these communities are just there because um, they're dealing with ways in which they're broken. Of course, everybody is to some degree dealing with ways in which their past has harmed them. So of course, people are also probably seeking healing, but they're also trying to be generative. Like I gave, I just gave you a case example of Rachel Hayden. She's trying, she's trying to use notions from, and she, you know, because of my work, she went and read L.A. Paul. She read and w went and read Agnes Callard, read about transformative experience, read about aspirational model. And, and then brought it in and tried to formulate that as a different framework and then argue for why it's a better framework than the standard models. Now, that to me is an important and generative thing to have done. I can give you other examples, but I'm just trying to answer uh, your question. I am trying to be responsible to uh, collecting the data. Uh, I've done a, a lot of this summer has been about participant observation and also talking to leaders of other communities to find out what's going on in their communities. Um, and hoping to turn some of that into more rigorous research. That's my. Uh, that's how I'm responding to, I think, your legitimate concern. I can tell you, but I have already made it clear, it's only preliminary data. It's ethnographic and pilot study, but that's what, it's, what I'm getting from it. And then, I, I, like, I do see these people as, as being generative, uh, generating real reflective responses and alternatives to pressing existential problems that they are actually undergoing. I think I would, I would agree potentially in the case of um, the lady, I forgot her name, sorry, that, that you just mentioned, Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. Um, from the estuaries and things that I've attended, um, so Paul, there's like, at, these are estuary meetup groups and I've um, done some of the online ones and I, I uh, drove down to do one in person when he was over here in, in the UK setting them up. I guess I've come across a lot of people who I would consider as having like, as so this is something you said in the Lex interview that I, that I liked and agreed with, right? When you said sometimes people sort of ask questions where they shouldn't expect an answer, like what's north of the North Pole, right? Where there's a confused yeah, assumption in there. And I think a lot of philosophical questions from, and I know that this is, you know, this is a philosophical position that people are going to disagree with, but I think a lot of philosophical questions, you know, rest on treating ordinary language like that. So maybe a word like truth, right? And kind of reifying it and asking certain questions about it 
um, as a noun that you might expect of other nouns where the paradigmatic noun is like a, a spatio-temporal object or something. So you might be like, well, you know, like, where is it? What's it made of? And stuff like that. Um, sure. and I think a lot of philosophical questions are quite, um, quite like that. But I guess I see people coming into some of these conversations with some of these philosophical confusions and almost, from my point of view, getting worse. They're not, they're not sort of like untangling themselves from these philosophical knots so they can get better. But instead, they're having like more dense vocabulary that they don't understand introduced that now they're going to use amongst the group. Or perhaps they're being recommended, you know, go and listen to these like sense makers and people like this who are um, going to introduce even more. And um, and there's, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is just going to be, this is going to come down to an empirical claim, right, of measuring how satiated these people feel in their lives and stuff. But I, just, I guess I just can't see how this is actually going to help people. It's going to help people like participate in this form of conversation, which might be fun for some people better. Um, but I don't know if it's going to like make them better at their jobs or have like more healthy habits or how, okay. uh, so maybe you can speak to some of that stuff. Well, I mean, there has been some work on this and, uh, and the degree to which these practices lead people into transformative experience, uh, which I talk about um, in the series. I mean, we have the work of Yaden, and he actually has done the empirical research and the noetic quality. And I've also done, uh, you know, a, a relevantly similar experiment in my lab. Um, and by many objective measures, people's lives do get better after these transformative experiences. They're better at their work, uh, their, their anxiety goes down, their relationships improve, um, and, and that's published work. So I, I, it, there's at least some prima facie empirical evidence that this actually does um, make people's lives better when they are able to undergo these transformative experiences. And the, and, the, and the thing about the transformative experiences is they often involve using language in odd ways. And, and you know, this is cross-cultural and cross-historical. And I, I understand your point. You don't want to license people to babble. I get that. But you also don't want to preclude people from bending the meaning of the words in order to articulate their transformative experience because that allows them to bring about the changes that are objectively measurable as better for them. Yeah, I think that's how you'd get someone like me on board, right? Is if I could see that data that it does improve people's lives, then I would advocate for these new uses of language. But mm -hmm. because at the minute I sort of, my my belief is slightly towards that it doesn't do that. And I maybe I just need to look at more data. That's why I sort of, um, resist these new uses of language and like i'm quite happy with the languages i was socialized into using and uh, mm -hmm. i don't want to talk about parabolic knowledge and stuff but um i if you want if there's anything you want to say to wrap up because i'm cognizant of time and that we're sort of running out um of it and that you've got other commitments so um i mean i'll say thank you for coming on john and um listening to my objections and responding to them is there anything you want to say just to conclude in the remaining minutes I want to, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you. And I came on because I wanted to demonstrate to you that I, I am um, invested in good faith uh, dialogue. I'll, I'll keep using your term because you're the host. Um, and that, thank you. Uh, and, 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 and that um, I wanted to also have an opportunity to make clear that I do share some of your concerns. And I, I was trying to indicate to you the way in which I'm not just sharing them in words, I'm sharing them in deed. Uh, and um, uh, I don't agree with uh, uh, everything you're saying, or maybe quite a bit. I, I, I'm much more critical of sort of uh, ordinary language philosophy and, and things like that. Ryle got it right about belief. He got it wrong about mental imagery, as far as I can tell. Um, and so I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant about that. But I'm hoping, I, w I wanted to show that I respect a lot of the criticisms you make. Um, I don't think you should be dismissed. And... I wanted, I wasn't here to try and convince you of anything other than um, I wanted to be responsible to what I was respecting in the comments you made. I don't like doing them on the YouTube comments because that is not the right medium. And, you know, you and I have had a couple of exchanges on Twitter. They never got nasty, which I'm proud of. Neither one of us got nasty. Uh, but that's also not a place in which um, we should carry out this. So I thought this was the, I just, Nathan, I just thought it was the right thing to do. And so that's why I'm here. Yeah, I can. I appreciate that. Um, I take the same attitude. I'm always sort of um, going and talking to people that I disagree with because I think it's 
the only way I've really ever found out that I'm wrong, right, is by talking to, because if I, it's actually why I don't like, a lot of people say it's better to have all this time to write a response and stuff. But the problem with that is that I can rationalize myself, yes. you know, more firmly into any position yep. if yep. I'm given the time. Whereas in a conversation, at least as long, I mean, there's a, there's obviously bad types of conversations where someone might like bully you or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. um, you know, in it, but in an actual good faith conversation, that, those that's usually when I'm going to find out that I'm wrong because some, someone's going to kind of like catch me out doing those rationalizations and point them out in a good way. And if I'm being honest with myself, I'll figure it out. And so, yeah, I appreciate you um, coming on to try and engage in that process yourself. Well, well thank you very much. I, I I hope that I have not been unfair to people who have been absent. Um, uh, sure. I, I tried my best to be responsible to them. Yeah, I think I think you were very very fair to them. Too fair, in my opinion, because I <laughs> obviously disagree. <laughs> but yeah, there we go. Okay, well I'll end the stream there. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, and yeah, go and check out John Viveki's channel if you want to know more about his meaning crisis stuff because he's got a playlist of fifty odd episodes if you're interested in that. Thank you very much.